Good evening. This is the Wine of Life podcast. I'm Pastor Wes, and uh, we are going to talk about what happened at the Southern Baptist Convention. Uh, when was it last week? Um, first, I want to uh, congratulate Steph Curry and the Golden State Warriors for winning another championship. This is his fourth, and he, he won the finals MVP, so happy for him. Uh, but we're going to talk about the Southern Baptist Convention. Um, a pastor by the name of Bart Barber was uh, elected to be the SBC president. Uh, I think there was a vote to remove um, to to remove the ERLC. I think it failed. Um, so just some things like that. There was a, there was some issues at the pastors conference about uh, voter cheating in the in the votes. I think fifty four votes were disallowed. So, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't great, but, uh, and the, the, uh, the task force passed, uh, some of the, uh, recommendations given by the sex abuse report from, uh, Guideposts or Guidestone, whatever that, whatever that company was, <clears throat> um, there was a task force then set up, um, and that the, ta- I think, I think they passed, um, they passed a thing to set up a database, and then they they passed another thing to say they're going to study the recommendations for another year. So I'm sure that'll just be another committee, as per usual. But um, the odd thing that sort of took the convention into farce was, um, and I did a video about this about a year ago, when uh, a pastor by the name of Rick Warren, who's a very famous pastor at uh, Saddleback, started ordaining women and then he held services celebrating the fact that he had ordained women and so there was a motion to disfellowship him now i did a thing before i said you know just he could just leave um if he's not going to adhere to the doctrines that we hold to but he didn't leave and he's remained in the sbc so there was a motion to disfellowship his church from the sbc and then uh, they allowed rick warren to come to the mic and give a speech. The speech was rather odd. Um, he spoke about himself and things that he'd done, and he, you know, like he he trained more than all seminaries combined, or something like that. He trained pastors, and he made the comment that he sees pastor rather as a gift rather than as an office. And so the question became, what is a pastor? And the Credentials Committee felt that this was a legitimate question um, and felt that the Baptist faith and message was not clear in what it says. I think it, Article 6, I think, of the Baptist faith. I don't know that. I don't know that document that well. But it's it, to describe the offices within the church, it says that there's pastors and there's deacons and that um, pastors, uh, according to Al Mohler, pastors has to do with the office and according to rick warren he said no no no, it has to do with the gift that we that uh people within the church have therefore a woman can have the gift of a, of being a pastor uh but not be in the office and so they claim that really what the baptist say the message is talking about is lead pastor rather than merely anyone who's ordained and so this started obviously a pretty big uh controversy I'm actually going to pull up uh, Danny uh, Danny Burke's article about this. He um, uh, he, he was a bit uh, annoyed by this, and uh, he wrote an article called "Will the SBC Now Accept Women as Pastors?" Um, so he says that um, our statement of faith, the Baptist faith and message, says the church's scriptural officers are pastors and deacons. While both men and women are gifted for service in the church, the office of pastor is limited to men as qualified by Scripture. So it was not a surprise that a messenger at last year's convention moved to have Saddleback disfellowshipped. This morning, the SBC's Credentials Committee released their response to the recommendation, and it is not good. This is his his statements. They said, the Credentials Committee report says, quote, it is the unanimous opinion of the Credentials Committee that the majority of Southern Baptists hold to the belief that the function of lead pastor 
elder, bishop, or overseer is limited to men as qualified by Scripture, and this was the intended definition of office of pastor, as stated in Article 6 of the Baptist Faith and Message. So I did get that right. The Credentials Committee has found little information evidencing the Convention's beliefs regarding the use of the title of pastor for staff positions with different responsibility and authority than that of the lead pastor. The Credentials Committee, this that's end quote. Now, this is Denny Burke. He says, quote, The Credentials Committee has unilaterally redefined the office of pastor to mean lead pastor. The Bible makes no such distinction. That lead qualification is nowhere in the Bible, nor is it in our statement of faith. The committee cites no evidence that the framers only intended lead pastors in their language about the office of pastor. It appears that they have added that qualification with no biblical, historical, or theological justification. So, what is a pastor then? Now, there is a little bit of um, there is a little bit of controversy with regards to the term that we uh, translate as pastor in the Bible is the word poimenos, and that's found in uh, places like Ephesians four, eleven, and twelve, and other places. And it is a gift, right? So the 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 names of offices within the church are the uh, episcopos, which is the bishop or the overseer, and um, what's the other one? Presbyteros, which is the elder or the presbyter. And we see those as interchangeable. Now, that's found in First um, Timothy 3, 1, but we see those terms as interchangeable because in Titus 1, 5 through 7, Paul uses those interchangeably. So we see that the, um, the presbyteros and the episcopos are actually the same offices, the same sy- synonymous terms used to describe the same office. The other office is obviously the diaconus, which is the, the, um, the deacon. And we claim that only men can be ordained to those positions. So anyone ordained within the church needs to be a man, according to the Bible. And what Denny Burke here is, is saying that there's no um, theological, historical, or biblical justification to, to redefine that. And so some people are saying there is, and that we're not clear. Um, Al Mohler went to the mic and said this is, he actually was part of the one who revised the statement in 2000. And he says, we we were trying to be clear because culturally we do call our bishop, we call them pastors or preachers. If you go to Southern Baptist Church, you're not going to find, if you ask the Southern Baptist what a bishop was, they probably say something to do with Catholics. If you ask them what um, a presbyter was, they might not know what that is, or they might say it has something to do with the Presbyterians. If you ask them what an elder was, they'll probably say an older person. If you ask them what an overseer is, they'll probably say somebody like on a financial committee or something. We just don't use that terminology. And most people know that, and I think Rick Warren also knows that. But he says, no, we, we describe pastor as something that is um, is a gift. And so women can have the gift of pastoring, according to him. Uh, the thing is, he was ordaining women. And uh, that is against the Baptist faith message because it's against Scripture. And so I want to talk about those three things that Danny Burke described. What, why do we hold that position that only men can do it? So I'm going to talk about the biblical uh, justification for that, the theological justification for it, and the historical justification for that. Because a lot of people who want women to be ordained or to hold these various positions in churches of authority, um, they don't. They make some statements regarding the Bible, but generally it has to do with um, what they feel women can and can't do as to, with regards to who they are. And the thing is, is that the Bible dictates what we are supposed to do because there are patterns to the way that God has made things <clears throat> and so we have to adhere to those patterns we can't go off of those patterns so it's not our job to try and reestablish different types of patterns other than what God has already established for us so I'm going to go into that and uh, I guess some of this it's, th- to me this isn't particularly controversial He's, he, I think that he should have been disfellowshipped but it has turned into some sort of controversial statement. So first I want to talk about why do we say that women cannot be um, pastors? Why do we hold that biblically? Where do we get that from? I'm first going to read uh, from uh, 1 Corinthians 14. I'm going to start in verse 33. 
uh, the Apostle Paul writes, For God is not a God of confusion, but of peace, as in all of the churches, all the churches of the saints, the, the women should keep silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be in submission. As the law also says, if there is anything they desire to learn, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or was it from you that the word of God came? Or are you the only ones it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge the things that I am writing to you are a command from the Lord. If anyone does not recognize this, he is not recognized. Now, there's some context to this because obviously women can speak in the church. They don't have to completely be quiet. There's other parts in 1 Corinthians where he talks about women praying in church and women prophesying in church. We know that um, there were Philip's daughters, the four prophetesses that spoke. So there's a certain context about the theology and what they're being taught in the church. They are not supposed to question that. They are supposed to question that at home, which is different than them praying in church. Um, the second part comes from 1 Timothy 2. And in 1 Timothy 2, the Apostle Paul <clears throat> writes this. He says, um, Let a woman learn quietly with all submissiveness, I do not permit a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man. Rather, she is to remain quiet. And this is the reason why he gives. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. And so there's a creation aspect. There's an order of creation. But then there's also a pattern of redemption in that. For Adam was, for, was formed first, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and became a transgressor. So that's in 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. So there's reasons, we, you know, it's not just randomly that, that there's, you know, just people just don't like women. Now, probably some people just don't like women, but there's biblical reasons why. Now, the theology behind that is this. Adam being made first, right? So there's the biblical justification that we claim that it should be just men. The theological justification is that Adam being made first, he is the one who is responsible for sinning. And therefore, he is the only one that can perform the act of reconciliation. And so in the household, the head of the household, according to creation, would be the husband because he is the man because Adam was made first. But Eve's sin did not um, cast us into death. It was by one man's sin that we ended up, that death came into the world, and it is by the righteousness of the new Adam, we could not be redeemed by a woman, we had to be redeemed by a man, it is through Jesus Christ that we are redeemed. So Christ, being now the husband and also the head of the church, there are now patterns that we follow. So the husband is supposed to represent who Christ is. The pastor also, or the bishop, or the overseer, or the elder, or presbyter, represents who Christ is. In Hebrews 8, 1-3, it says that Christ is the liturgos. He's performing the liturgy before the Father, which is, the liturgy is not just people reading things, um, you know, doing ceremonial things in churches. I know some high church Protestants or Catholics or Orthodox perform liturgy. But it's not just that. It's actually a public office that you hold that um, represents as, as an administrator uh, and, and is the public face of a particular area or congregation. So in the Greek, um, they would have liturgos that would hold, that would be like a mayor or something like that. That's how they would call it. But in the ecclesiastical context, Paul himself says in Romans uh, 16 that he is the liturgos for the Gentiles. Right? And so each pastor in each of their own congregations is the liturgos. We find unity in our pastor. And what the pastor then does is, is more than just teach. There's a problem that we have in our you know, evangelical churches where we have blurred the lines between what a pastor is and then just being able to stand on a stage and, and you know, be good at speaking. That is, not, that, that is an aspect of what a pastor can do because he has to, he has to be able to teach and preach. But... That is not what shepherding or pastoring really is. That's not what overseeing really is. And so saying, well, a woman, why can't a woman just stand up there? A woman speaking on stage, that is not the fullness of what a pastor is. And so a woman should not be ordained in that because a woman cannot perform the act of reconciliation. She cannot perform that role 
because not because she's less than or that man is greater than but because it is man who's the one that sinned and so it is man who's the one that reconciles and so the head of the household being the husband the head of the household of God being the pastor and so um, we, we don't ordain women to hold that position any ordination of women uh, they are doing something that they ought not be doing and and the way that it's written in the Baptist faith the message they should be disfellowshipped the second part to that is is that the the bishop the pastor is the liturgos right so he's the face of unity but he's also the one who presides over communion and a woman cannot preside over communion because what communion is is the establishment of the new covenant and this can only be performed by a liturgos and it can only be performed by one who can be as a mediator now what the pastor is doing is that christ gave his body we now are are, are coming forward to the altar and to the table of god that's what paul tells us in first corinthians 11 who got to go to the table the priests and they ate the bread of the presence and that was the unity of the entire community. Not everybody got to go to the, to the table. And so allowing us to come before God and giving us the sacrament is something only a man can do because the picture of what, what Adam, Adam was, the picture of what the priests were, and now the picture of what the bishops are, are, are that they are the reconciler and the uniter of mankind. So they are pictures of Christ. The husband is a picture of Christ for his family. The pastor is a picture of Christ for his church. Uh, Aaron and his sons were a picture of Christ in the work that he was going to do in reconciliation. Not merely what he did, just did on the cross, but what he's doing daily for us. Christ, of course, is working that in heaven, standing before the Father. And so throughout the Bible, and I know a lot of people say this, there's a lot of spiritual women in the Bible who, had, who were great women, right? So we, we find Deborah, for instance, is a judge. Um, Hulda was a prophetess. We have Priscilla, who teaches Apollos privately with her husband, Aquila. We have um, Phoebe, who's called a deaconess, and I'll go with deaconess. I'll deal with that in the historical part. Uh, we have uh, Junia, which is the uh, known amongst the apostles, right? And a lot of people said she's an apostle. None of these held offices within the church. Uh, and if you look in the Old Testament, there is no woman who ever makes a sacrifice. Uh, Enoch, or not Enoch, um, what's his name? Cain and Abel make the sacrifices, right? Noah makes the sacrifices. Moses and Aaron then make the sacrifices, and the priests then make sacrifices after that, along with kings at a certain point in time. So David makes certain sacrifices. We see Solomon making sacrifices. We have no, um, we have nowhere in the Old Testament where a woman makes a sacrifice, right? And so the, the um, function of the bishop, the overseer, the elder presbyter, is that they are the liturgos, and they preside over communion, which is a very different thing than just being able to stand on stage. And so men do that because men have to be the picture of the one who reconciles, which is Jesus Christ. And only a man can do that because it was a man's sin that led to mankind's death. Mankind is the recon Man has to be the reconciler for mankind. This is why Jesus came as a man in assumed flesh. So that's why that's the theological justification you can argue with that but that's the theological justification now i'll get to the whole historical justification something i've been pretty disappointed in is that pastors and and messengers and people who are um part of congregations within the southern baptist convention arguing for women's pastors have really um tried to correlate this doctrine with evils from the past and so this is a this is an SBC pastor I believe it's a, at Cornerstone Baptist Church in Texas uh, somewhere I don't know but he's on he's on Twitter. Uh, his name is is Pastor Dwight uh, McKissick. Um, I guess he's called Pastor Mac. Um, he, I I use him because he's a pretty prominent voice. A lot of people he's on Twitter a lot. And but he writes this: For years the SBC erroneously convinced themselves it was biblically permissible to devalue and mistreat AAs. He's talking about African Americans. Simultaneously, they've adopted a less severe but similar posture with women under a false veneer biblical approval. Grateful God has raised up Rick Warren to push back. And so what he's saying is, is that the idea that the doctrine that women should not be able to serve as pastors within a church, should not be ordained, 
is somehow is correlates to things like Jim Crow or slavery from the past. And he, I actually got, was in a conversation just a few days ago on Twitter, and and uh, someone just explicitly stated that if if you if you think women shouldn't be pastors, you are a white supremacist, and so sort of connecting these two things. So I, I, I you know, I want to push back on that here. Um, for one, um, the doctrines and and the 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 Bible that was used to justify things like slavery and Jim Crow and, and mistreatment, things like you know the the idea of the curse of Ham, that, that was complete nonsense. Um, that was not generally the uh, church's position throughout history. Read the Cappadocians, read Basil of Caesarea on slavery and things like that, uh, or Gregory Nazianzus and other people spoke about slavery as being sinful and being wrong. Um, you know, the idea of the curse of Ham, that's terrible theology, that's terrible exegesis. It was not Ham who was cursed, it was Canaan. Canaan, obviously, Canaanites still exist today. They are obviously not black people. They were to be um, ruled by descendants of Shem, which were going to be Israelites. And, of course, Israel came into the land of Canaan and took that uh, later on. Uh, obviously, Anglo-Saxon immigrants that came to the New World were not descendants of Shem. We are not Semites. So that sort of thing is bad theology. That is completely different than the doctrine of who should be um, ordained or not as as pastors or not. And I'm going to read some from the early uh, church, some writings from the early church, uh, and also uh, from some of the um, early church fathers. Um, so Tertullian writes this. This was an African um, in the... Uh, second or early third century, he says it is of no concern how diverse be their views. Uh, speaking of heretics, so long as they conspire to erase the one truth, they are all puffed up, all offer knowledge uh, before they have finished as catechumens. How thoroughly learned they are, and the heretical women themselves, how shameless they are. They make bold to teach, to debate, to work exorcisms, and to under take cures that's a a work against the heretics chapter 41 4 through 5 that was written around 8200 he uses this verse in the veiling of virgins his work in 8206 he writes this it is not permitted for a woman to speak in the church but neither is it permitted for her to offer nor to claim herself a lot in any manly function not to say sacerdotal office. And what he's speaking of, again, is communion. Women are not allowed to, to uh, perform communion, preside over that. Hippolytus, in the apostolic tradition, uh, chapter 11, in, written in uh, the early 3rd century, AD 215, when a widow is to be appointed, she is not to be ordained, but is designated by being named a widow. A widow is appointed by words alone and is then associated with other widows. Hands are not imposed on her because she does not offer the oblation and she does not conduct the liturgy. Now the oblation being communion, the liturgy being the liturgy. Ordination is for the clergy because of the liturgy. But a widow is appointed for prayer and prayer is the duty of all. And so the way that we ordained is through the passing on, is through the laying on of hands. This comes down from Moses all the way through, and I'll talk about that a little bit at the end. Um, the Dia Scalia in uh, chapter three, uh, books or book three, chapter six, one through two, eighty two twenty five. He says, or the writer says, uh, for it is not to teach that you women are appointed, for he, God the Lord Jesus Christ, our teacher, sent us the twelve apostles. Now this is a, a work that makes it they are claiming to be the 12 apostles. They are not. It was written much later, but it's supposed to be a teaching of the apostles. He sent the 12 out to teach the chosen people and the pagans. But there were female disciples among us, Mary of, uh, of Magdala, Mary the daughter of Jacob, and the other Mary. He did not, however, send them out with us to teach the people, for it had been necessary, for if it had been necessary uh, for when, that women should teach, then our teacher would have directed them to instruct all along with us. So again, women are not to teach men. Uh, Fermilion uh, writes this. Uh, this is in uh, Cyprian's letter, so uh, letter 74. This is the mid-3rd century. There suddenly rose among us certain women who in a state of ecstasy announced herself as a prophetess and acted as if filled with the Holy Ghost. 
through the deceptions and illusions of the demon. This woman pre previously said about deluding believers in a variety of ways. Among the means which she had deluded many was daring to pretend that through proper invocation, the consecrated bread and perform the Eucharist. In other words, women cannot perform uh, the Eucharist. In the Council of Nicaea, Canon 19, similarly, in regard to the deaconesses, now this is, has to deal with what, what deaconesses are, as with all who are enrolled in the registry, the same procedure is to be observed. We have made mention of the deaconesses who have been enrolled in this position, although not having been in any way ordained, they're certainly to be numbered among the laity. And so the title of deaconess was given to women because of the service they perform. Now, part of the services they perform uh, are things like baptisms and things like going out to visit other women. The th that what they did in the early church was they baptized you in the nude. You would take your clothes off, you would then be baptized, and then you would have a white robe, and they would give you the white robe, and then the priest would, um, or the, uh, the bishop would place um, oil on your forehead as chrismation, as a, as a picture of the Holy Spirit coming down upon you like Christ's baptism. Um, we obviously don't baptize in the, new, in the new today, and so we don't have women doing that, but women still perform these. Um, women still go out and visit. They still teach other women and so on. The Council of Laodicea in Canon 11, AD 360, so this is a little bit past the middle of the 4th century. The so-called presbyteriesses or presidentesses are not to be ordained in the church. So we do not ordain women. And I could go on and on. There's a part for Epiphanius of Salamis uh, against heresies, John Chrysostom, the Apostolic Constitutions. I, I would suggest you read all of these. So read John Chrysostom's work on the priesthood. Um, there's a work called the Apostolic Constitutions. There's a work that Augustine, that's an unfinished work, about heresies. And um, I'll read it this real fast. Um, the Quintilians are heretics who give women predominance so that these two can be honored with the priesthood among them. They say namely that Christ revealed herself to Quintilla and Priscilla, speaking of the Montanist um, heresies, in the form of a woman. In other words, women cannot be among what they call the priesthood, we would just call um, the clergy. And so this is a, a universal by consensus, and I don't like to use the consensus a lot about the church fathers, because obviously there, there are going to be some who don't hold all of the exact positions that we would hold, but it's pretty well universal that the early church, African and Asian men, uh, um, interpreted the scriptures in the same way that we do today. And so I think it's very um, disingenuous and in some cases ignorant. And pastors are doing it. That's what's so disappointing to say that um, holding this doctrine has something to do with racism or oppression. This is the, the, this is the way that the church have interpreted who should be part of uh, the clergy for 2,000 years. And so I think that it's really unhelpful to try and start a dialogue with anybody by immediately demonizing them as racist and white supremacists because they hold um, to these things. Now that does, you know, I'm sure there are men who hate women and genuinely believe that women have no role in the church and all that sort of stuff. But that is not the basis of the doctrine, and we don't judge doctrines based on the character of some of the people who proclaim them. Right? There were there are people who proclaim Jesus, but Jesus will say when he sees them, "I never knew you." Does that mean that the deity of Christ is wrong because there were some people who were false converts or who, ne who, who never really truly served Christ? No, we don't judge our doctrines um, based on stuff like that. You know, we don't should never judge doctrines based on the personal experience we have of a particular person who claims that doctrine. So um, we need to study these things out. And I would agree with Danny Burke. There is no biblical theological or historical justification to claim that we don't know what a pastor is. Now, could we have a, a conversation about ad, revising the Baptist faith and message, and instead of using the word pastor, using bishop or overseer or elder or presbyter? Uh, yeah, we could do something like that. Uh, you know, I wouldn't be against that, but um, it's quite disappointing that there are people claiming they don't know what a pastor is or claiming that um, they're not quite sure there's confusion over the issue of who should be ordained or not. Um, that, that's really disappointing. And I, with regards to, um, with regards to uh, 
the SBC, um, the fact that that was a question this year, it leads you to think what what's going to be the question next year. If the question this year is what's a pastor, what is going to be the question next year? It's I think we're sort of going downhill here with this. So I was disappointed in that, but I wanted to bring that up just to say we do know what a pastor is. We ought to know. Um, maybe we could make our language more precise. That's a fair point. But we, we shouldn't have these conversations about who should be ordained or not. If you are somebody, I think there are people who are you know have good faith arguments about egalitarianism. If you are somebody who thinks that women should be um, ordained, um, make your case biblically. Um, you know, you have to realize the idea of, of women not being ordained, that is the universal position of the church for 2,000 years, right? And just now, just because something's old doesn't mean it's necessarily right, but it is on you to present your case biblically and historically and justify it. You, you can't just say that anyone who holds this is a racist or anyone who holds this is a misogynist or sexist or whatever. So that's my bit on that. Um, so that, you know, the, the convention is, you know, it is what it is. Um, it, it seems like it's going a bit downhill, but, um, if you enjoyed this hit like subscribe and hopefully you'll check out the next one I do and I will see you later. Bye.